Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. James Hong, he shined in the entertainment industry for nearly seven decades, and he's garnered hundreds of film and television credits along the way. But as Ben Mankiewicz shows us, he has no plans to stop anytime soon. The characters keep coming. Hong already has projects lined up to add to those 445 credits. Are you going to retire? Whether it's just nobler in the mind that suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to die. Okay, what was the question now? I think we have our answer. You're not, uh, you're not retiring. What's that word? I mean, I, if I were making a movie, I'd hire you for something. I'd be the first person I'd hire. Yeah, well, it has to be at least double scale, okay? <laughs> well, then you're out. <laughs> I knew it. More exclusive excerpts from Ben Mankiewicz's conversation with James Hong are coming up a little later in the show. I take it, based on your what you initially wanted to do with your life, that you were a pretty good student, right? You get into the University of Minnesota, you're gonna be, a, you're gonna be an engineer. True, true, but um, I had a late start. Um, at the age of four, my father took the whole family back into uh, uh, Kaolong because he thought we were becoming too Americanized. Oh. Um, so so uh, he took, you know, uh, the, the family of, of uh, five kids. And my mother had seven children. At that time, it, I think it was uh, five, and we went back to Kaolong. And I went to Yokshi grade school, so I was, uh, had my first four grades in a Chinese school. Of course, I didn't speak English, you know. Then Jonathan Vigliotti brings us to Alaska to learn about a native dessert called a gutak, also known as Eskimo ice cream. Village elder Esther Green still uses a recipe passed down by her mother. What is a gutak used for? As a dessert to eat with fish, and the oil helps you physically to stay healthy. Of course, no two households make a gudak the same way. Lori O'Brien has her own approach. And we just measure with the palm of our hand. <laughs> so, so far these don't look like ingredients that go in an ice cream. Oh no. For someone who knows what Ice cream is like vanilla or chocolate or cookie dough ice cream. This doesn't look like making ice cream. <laughs> That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. He voiced Mr. Ping in the Kung Fu Panda franchise, and he starred in Big Trouble in Little China, just to name a few. But not every experience on set was particularly euphoric. As you might imagine, in one instance, he was forced to face racism as well. Here's Ben Mankiewicz with James Hong. Yeah. A sit-down interview with James Hong can morph unexpectedly into an episode of Dancing with the Character Actors. Should we dance a little and get some... Well, I'm looking forward to the dance. Is that now? Are we dancing now? You have to, you have to think this is an old man doing it. James Hong can dance all he wants. His nearly 70-year Hollywood career is certainly worth celebrating. I've been an actor since uh, 1953 or 4. Uh, uh, probably the only living guy that has worked with Groucho Marx. That's where it began with Groucho. We'll get to that in a minute. Today, 445 screen credits later, Hong has been in Chinatown, Blade Goodbye. Runner, Mr. Bonanza, The Big Bang Theory, and a memorable episode of Seinfeld. Cartwright! Just like that. Telephone for Cartwright. You know answer, she swear, and I hang up. You, you might have been in more movies and TV shows than anyone else ever. I would think so. The major, you know, movies and TV, there's some guys that have been in stage plays and such, you know. Ah, who goes to plays? Forget the 445 credits. That he even has four credits is a tribute to his fierce determination. Homemade the son of Chinese immigrants, Hong was born in Minneapolis in 1929. It was Chinatown, but in Minneapolis, Chinatown consists of two Chinese stores. <laughs> and one of them was your dad? Yeah, yeah. He had an herb store, 
and we live on the second floor. As a young boy, Hong didn't speak much English. That made him a target in school. I think my class was, uh, you know, probably 500 kids. I was the only Asian student. So the bullies would pick on me and beat me up. So because, you know, bullies are bullies, right? They'll just pick on the underdog. Hong's parents wanted him to be an engineer. That's what he studied in college. Then he was drafted to fight in the Korean War. What was it like to be a Chinese American in the Army? One of my Army fellow mates there said to me, um, you know, James, I think you might have a problem because if, if you are in that American uh, Army outfit, charge the Koreans, they, they will shoot you because you're an American. And if you retreat, the Americans will shoot you also because they think you are a cook dressed in an American outfit. So he got me a little bit perturbed with that statement, you know. Hong entertained troops by doing impressions. He got laughs, and then he got an idea. After the war, he moved to Los Angeles where he pursued his new dream, showbiz. A big break came when he appeared on Groucho Marx's radio show, You Bet Your Life. Where are you from, Jim? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minnesota? Of course, I, I thought you might be, because Hong is a fine old Scandinavian name. <laughs> Next came small parts on TV, often demeaning. He was the Chinese soldier, the Chinese prisoner, the guy running a Chinese laundry. You didn't play fully rounded characters. You played stereotypes, and that's it. If you didn't play the roles that were given to you, you, you would be not working at all. And so in a sense, in order to keep up my craft, I had to take these roles as the Chinese rail, railroad worker or laundryman and so forth. Though he was getting more work, Hong was also forced to confront racism. One incident still stings. That's a very hurtful thing. And um, I was in London uh, doing The Son of Charlie Chan. It was a rifle that fired the shot, right? Well, J. Carroll Nash was the um, Charlie Chan, you know. Every day he had to push his eyes up like this, and he had to push his eyelid against that piece so that you wouldn't see the space between the, the piece and his own eye of doing everything. You know, I, I, that got under his skin. So one day he was on camera, I was off camera. I missed one line. He says, what is this? A school for Chinese actors? And, and you know, I was shocked, I didn't know what to do. He started to advance me. I, I had my fist clenched. I thought he was gonna slug me or something, you know. He walked past and had me fired. And I went to his dressing room and apologized. I said, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Nash, you know, I missed the line. He wouldn't forgive me, he had me fired. Uh, don't talk about it, it just hurts too much. So essentially, he, Got you fired because you had the audacity to be of Chinese descent in a movie filled with Chinese people. That's right. I think he just was very prejudiced. By the 1970s, Hong had already amassed a few hundred credits, including playing Faye Dunaway's butler in Chinatown. He's also in the sci-fi classic Big Trouble in Little China a role he happily that. recalls. A girl with green eyes to satisfy Ching Dai, a girl brave enough to embrace the naked blade. And when, and I, when I found her, I shall marry her. <laughs> Look, I don't understand. More recently, he's been in every iteration of Kung Fu Panda, and just a few months ago, Hong finally received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He is a living character actor legend and a champion for standing up against racism and fighting the stereotypes faced by Asian Americans in Hollywood and beyond. In every role I played, I tried to make it a human being. And I, that's why I think I kept working because I think not only the studio, but the people saw that James was portraying a Chinese as a real person and not just a cliche character. It's not easy to do to impart humanity into a character that is written so stereotypically. Yes, that's true. The characters keep coming. Hong already has projects lined up to add to those 445 credits.
are you going to retire? Whether it is nobler in the mind that suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to die. Okay, what was the question now? I think we have our answer. You're not, uh, you're not retiring. What's that word? I mean, I, if I were making a movie, I'd hire you for something. I'd be the first person I'd hire. Yeah, well, it has to be at least double scale, okay? <laughs> well, then you're out. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> James, thank you. thank you. More from Ben Mankiewicz and James Hong coming up in just a few minutes. But first, pikefish is on the menu, and not in the way you think it's served. When you think of ice cream, flavors such as dark chocolate or strawberry may come to mind. Vanilla, too. But in Alaska, their version of ice cream includes a unique ingredient. Pikefish. Here's Jonathan Bigliotti. Morning rush hour moves at a different pace in the Arctic outpost of Bethel, Alaska. More than 400 miles from Anchorage, the only way to get there is by boat or plane. But in Bethel, travel is still an obstacle. The main road is a frozen river six months out of the year. And along that seasonal path, native Alaskan Lori O'Brien treks in search of the key ingredient to her generation's old dessert. Oh, nice out, nice out, nice day. We drilled through a four-foot sheet of ice, baited a hook, and then waited for a bite. Oh, oh my God, I do have one on the bottom here. Right. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. That's pretty good. Your very first pike. My first pike. Pikefish, not exactly something you'd expect to find in a dessert but a key ingredient in a guduk, also known as Eskimo oh, ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> like most traditional native dishes, it features only ingredients hunted and gathered. Of course, I've been doing this ever since I was born. Ever since you were born. Yeah. How, how many years young are you? 84. 84 years old. Mm -hmm. Village elder Esther Green still uses a recipe passed down by her mother. What is a guduk used for? As a dessert to eat with fish, and the oil helps you physically to stay healthy. Of course, no two households make a guduk the same way. Lori O'Brien has her own approach. And we just measure with the palm of our hand. <laughs> so, so far, these don't look like ingredients that go in an ice cream. Oh, no. For someone who knows what ice cream is, like vanilla or chocolate or cookie dough ice cream, this doesn't look like making ice cream. <laughs> the first tedious steps are boiling and deboning the fish. Once clear, the mixing begins. We add the seal oil. And reindeer fat. After about 30 minutes, Lori adds our catch of the day. And we have about a 10 day window to- And pick locally this. picked salmon berries, named for their color, not taste. The final ingredient is snow from the backyard. So here is Eskimo ice cream. It's surprisingly sweet. The, the berries are what I taste most. I can taste the, the fishiness of it too. It does not taste like haagen -Dazs. <laughs> <laughs> It can't be found like haagen either. Where in town, what store can I go into to get some? It can't be bought in the store. It goes back to your senses and your palate. When you have a food that only your mother made, it brings you back to those times it connects you back to your history. Here's what it looks like. If you know your food, how to get it, where to get it, how to handle it, you have plenty of food to eat. And hopefully, plenty of Eskimo ice cream. 
Now, this is kind of an embarrassing moment I, I'll reveal to you, for, probably for the first time. We were waiting uh, off a camera to, to enter. And, you know, Jennifer is a beautiful uh, Jennifer Jones. So I, I just looked down and I saw this run in her stocking, you know. After the break, so more with James Hong. Said, uh, Stay with us. Jennifer, but uh, you, you have a run in your stocking. And she got very perturbed, you know. As promised, here's more from Ben Wankowitz's conversation with actor James Hong. I got into the movie industry uh, with an agent that was very early, of course, in 1954, Bessie Lou Agency. She was the only Asian-American agency that was in town here. You know, that's how small Hollywood was. And for some reason, I was what they were looking for because they put me in approximately 10 movies and TVs per year. So I, I just averaged that in the early years, you know, it slowed down a little now, but um, so I gather all these, um, what, over 500, 600 uh, credits as far as movies and TV. Now there's voiceovers, of course. Five or 600, do you think you may have gone over 600 credits? The first one was with um, Clark Gable, that's how old it is, you know, and John Wayne. What film was that? With Clark Gable, it was Soldier of Fortune. I think he had just come back from a hiatus of some kind. And so it was nice to be in a film of his. And uh, John Wayne's uh, second movie was uh, uh, Blood Alley with Lauren Bacall. And you had a scene with Lauren Bacall. Yes, a soldier. I was, of course, a communist soldier, dragging her off and, uh, you know, questioning her or whatever. And I didn't know exactly what was going on, obviously, you know. So I made some stupid comments here and there. Um, uh, for instance, like, in, um, love is a many splendid thing. <coughs> and this is kind of an embarrassing moment I, I'll reveal to you, for, probably for the first time. We were waiting uh, off a camera to, to enter. And, you know, Jennifer is a beautiful uh, Jennifer Jones. So I, I just looked down and I saw this run in her stocking, you know. And so stupid was young James Hong said, uh, Pardon me, Jennifer, but uh, you, you have a run in your stocking. And she got very perturbed, you know. And so she went, went on the rehearsal. He says, I'd like to take a few moments off. So she hustled off to put on a new stocking. So I, I knew I said something wrong. But, you know, young James Hong never knew when to stop. <laughs> you didn't know you weren't supposed to uh, tell the uh, leading lady uh, that she had a run in her stocking. I don't know. That seems helpful. You would think so, you know. I was trying to do a good deed. I take it, based on your, what you initially wanted to do with your life, that you were a pretty good student, right? You get into the University of Minnesota, you're gonna be, a, you're gonna be an engineer. True, true, but um, I had a late start. Um, at the age of four, my father took the whole family back into uh, uh, Gaolong because he thought we were becoming too Americanized. Oh. Um, so, so uh, he took, you know, uh, the, the family of, of, of five kids. And my mother had seven children. At that time, it, I think it was uh, five, and we went back to Kaolung. And I went to Yokji grade school, so I was, uh, had my first four grades in a Chinese school. Of course, I didn't speak English, you know. And, and then you uh, came back to, to Minnesota? Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I will show you that little uh, certificate um, uh, of how I... Uh, the passport, you know, at that time, coming back to Minnesota at the age of nine. Then I started uh, Washington grade school at that time. Can you imagine being in Washington grade school, not learning, knowing a word of English? And so that was a very trying experience. But somehow, I guess that spirit of wanting to do good and be excellent in, in English, uh, I progressed very fast and caught up in, in junior high school. But you did study to be an engineer. Electrical engineer, what kind of engineer? Ah, Lipton's, I think. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> Minnesota. By the way, we provide only the best. Lipton, huh? that's right. <laughs> they serve only Lipton's here. <laughs> Where is my jasmine and green tea? Have you never heard of it? We'll get somebody on it right away. Green tea, please. We're crying out loud, it's James Hong. He's got 687,000 credits. Get him some jasmine green tea.
<laughs> no respect at all, yeah. I tell you. I don't think it's coming. Um, well, anyway, yeah, the engineering in Minnesota. Yes, I attended the civil engineering program in University of Minnesota. And um, I went three years there and then uh, three, and then I went into army, served in the artillery uh, uh, section or uh, division. And then I, when I got out, I, I came to California. So you, you get out here, uh, uh, you come out with your friend. What was your friend's name? Don Parker, yeah, yeah he so you, was my comedy partner. Yeah. So you come out with your comedy partner, Don Parker, and uh, who's the first movie star you see? We, we drove through the, uh, from San Francisco across the Coinga Pass. In those days, there, there were no freeways, right. you know. So it was the Coinga Pass, and it went up and down and up and down. It was not very straight in the sense of uh, level, you know. So I was very scared, and uh, all, all these trucks, uh, uh, you know, ahead of us. Uh, from Minnesota, you don't have those, see those semi trucks. So we came into town. And we went down, I believe, in either Sunset or Hollywood, which drove through. We were wide-eyed kids from Minnesota, and there it was. Hamburger Hamlet was on one of those boulevards in those days, and right in the front of the the. Uh, the Hamburger Hamlet was Jack Palance. I said, both of us went crazy because, you know, he was our hero in those days, uh, Jack Palance, the great actor in those movies. That was the first guy I saw. <laughs> I said, I want to be like him. <laughs> I want to eat a cheeseburger like Jack Palance. Yeah, at Hamburger Hamlet. Well, congratulations, you've, you've made it. You're having, you're having uh, a cup of Lipton tea uh, with Ben Mankiewicz. It's really the same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, but no, it where isn't. Where is my <laughs> hamburger? For the love cheese. of God, now get him a cheeseburger. <laughs> All right, Joel. I'm Lee Cowell. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.